selectors and rules all over the place. A clean CSS. Oh, frustration free, I'd say. Especially if you're an author jumping into some other author's project. Well, let's get into some tips, shall we? Tip number one is to find a consistent casing strategy throughout your project. And there are a few that you can choose from. Camel case, the visual grouping, camel case. It's not there, but you do have that uppercase to give you sort of a separation. And you can double click to select the entire selector name, which is good for building selectors on top of that. Snake case, you can also double click and it provides a visual separation with an underscore. Little fin finger gymnastics and you have to press shift to get the underscore. Something to think about. Beam case, you can select individual parts of the selector, beam, case, and you don't have to use shift to get the hyphen, which is pretty cool. And demonic bend case, someone just threw a bunch of hyphens and dashes and underscores and created a system and they're like, everyone should use this, it's great. No benefits. And making sure you have a consistent casing strategy, other authors will dive right in and they'll see what you're using and they'll mimic it. That way your brain has one less thing to worry about when you're writing styles. One quick thing to note here is I put a space right after the selectors and right before the curly bracket just to provide a visual separation and also a line break in between each individual selector. That'll just help you quickly grab and pick out individual selectors without trying to like mash and read between the lines. Tip number two is to use descriptive selector names. That'll help you create unique components and avoid all those style conflicts. So right here I've said page header. That means it's the header of the page. I could have said header, but what is it the header of? Is it the header of my header? Is it the footer of my header? You, you don't know, it's just a header. It could be of a card, it could be of anything. But page header itself is very descriptive. It's telling me the header of the page. And not only that, I've continued that relationship down to my other selectors within my style sheet. So page header groups also shares a relationship with page header, not only the name, but also the order within the file. By putting it directly after page header, I've said that this is a child of page header. And that could carry on to other children as well. So if you have something plural like groups or items, you can also continue that relationship with items or group. And these kinds of naming schemes really help establish and strengthen the relationship between the DOM and the style sheet. <laughs> <laughs> Tip number three is to keep it classy. One class, no IDs, no two I classes, just one class. For this example, you have control over the markup. Div.card, direct descendant, title. Oh, that's a lot of specificity going on and that'll be really hard to overwrite if there's ever a hover state from your parent or something that's going on. To improve that, we could just drop the div and drop the direct descendant selector. Dot card dot title, that's getting a little bit better. We have two classes, but that title itself, ooh, that's a little bit too generic. To improve that, we could do dot card title, right? So now we know exactly what kind of title is. It's a card title, but we're only using one class to do it. That will be incredibly easy to override in the future without having to deal with all these specificity rules and and verbose selector language going on. <laughs> Tip number four is organize your rules. And by rules, I mean overflow hidden, top zero, background purple. Organize those. It could be A to Z, or the method that I prefer is the fastbot way, which is dimensions first, positioning after, and then A to Z after that. So I'm gonna clean up this touch effect card with the rule organization that I'm comfortable with. 
I'll take my width property, put it up there, put that height right below width because we naturally say width and height when we're describing dimensions out in the wild. For my positioning properties, I'm going to put them right in the center, right below my dimensional properties. And I usually like to do top right, bottom left, top right, bottom left. That's how it flows within shorthand. That's how it should flow within a rule organization. And that goes the same for margin and padding as well. Margin top, margin right, margin bottom, margin left. And after that, it would just be A to Z, which is extremely easy to do. And the reason for organizing your rules is you get a quick snapshot of your selector and what's going on with that selector. I can see that this is a box and it's aligned to the top right of the parent component. And there's some other appearance styles going along with it. <laughs> Tip number five is to take advantage of white space. So this box shadow rule, it's comma separated, but it's all on one line. That's kind of hard to read. So if you bump it down, it just makes it a lot easier to visualize because it's stacked just like it would appear on the page. And you can do that with other rules as well, like transition. So transition, you could say box shadow is transitioning 200 milliseconds. And well, you would follow the same rule organization. So background would go up top for 200 milliseconds. And that stacking order, boom, boom, it mimics the exact same stacking order that you have within a CSS rule set itself. And you could definitely keep improving other rules as well. So gradient is a prime example of stacking in a really nice way to easily visualize the gradient to write. But what am I going to do? You know it, red and blue. Yeah. So that is way easier to read than if it were in a linear format, just one straight, one straight line. Could you imagine writing all your code in one line? It'd probably drive you crazy. You've entered the speed run mode. We're going to go through tips really, 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 really fast. Tip number six, organize your advanced CSS utility rule sets as well as custom properties. Put your mixins up at the top. Put your custom properties below that. And then put your other properties, all the other stuff right below. Tip number seven is keep it simple. You got extends, you got lists, you got maps, you got everything in your tool belt. But make sure that you're doing it without confusing other developers. Tip number eight, stick your interaction states as close as possible to the default styles. Sometimes you want to style the child when you hover over the parent. A terrible way to do that would be to put the child right within the parent. That's just asking for bouncing up and down throughout the file. That don't fly in my house. A better way to do it would be to utilize the parent selector within the child selector and style it that way. All your styles for Donkey Pong Link would be right there where you need them as you're styling on the hover state of the parent. Bada bing, bada boom, bang, bang, bang. Now entering sleep mode. <gasps> Tip number nine is to stick your media queries as close as possible to your selector as well. And this follows the same rules as the interaction stuff. Now, the reason I say that is because the mobile section or the desktop section at the bottom of the file that I've seen before, or even the mobile file or the desktop file, it's crazy. Why bounce in between files or bounce within the same file? when you could have your media query right there in the selector that you're affecting. It just is a very nice relationship and it's very easy to see what's being manipulated right there next to the other styles, the default styles for that selector. Tip number 10, we got two hands now, is to utilize the cascade for browser defaults. And what I mean by that is to override default styles that won't really get in the way with other parts of your project. For example, the link. Links by default have a text decoration when you hover over them. But if you're doing text decoration none, that really won't mess up any of your other components as you're styling. The same for SVG. With SVG, there's a little bit of a space underneath each SVG. So if you put display block, it neutralizes that space. And because the SVG will be in some kind of flex container or grid container, having display block won't necessarily break the layout, but you'll get rid of that space. Tip number 11 is to choose between isolation or utility-driven component development. With isolated component development, each component would have a unique set of classes. This testimonials component would never share classes with the cards component. It would never share classes with the header component, and it wouldn't share classes with the gosh darn social links either. 
you'll never have a moment where changing one style is going to affect some random part of the page that you had no idea was going to happen, which is one of the main frustrations of CSS, just knowing what's going to happen when you change that one style. Though there are a few difficulties with this approach. One is that you have to think of unique names all the time, and some components could look similar, so it could be kind of hard to decide or to think of a descriptive name. The other downside to this approach is you often find yourself repeating chunks of code. Grids can look very similar to each other, buttons can look similar, links can look similar, and you can mitigate this by using mix-ins or other types of utilities, but just be careful not to make it too complex in order to make up for the downsides to this approach. With utility-driven component development, you use a bunch of generic classes that have a single focused purpose. <laughs> what this means is you can slap on a bunch of classes to your component to rapidly prototype and build out your design. And the good part about this approach is you're not thinking of unique class names for each component, and is it uses very consistent values that are aggregated from the theme file. So your spacing, your typography, your colors will all be consistent because you're sort of constrained into these utility class names that have been generated for you. The downside to this approach, however, is the markup gets really, really crazy. I'm talking like, and the developer experience for debugging is a little bit frustrating because each class has one style associated with it. So if you're in the inspector and you're toggling classes on and off, on and off, that gets really frustrating to start bouncing up and down between all these different class names, these selectors, or even filtering through the class names that you've created and deleting them and seeing which ones work within your project. The flip side to that is you can quickly plop on a class as you're developing on the page to see what will work and what will look better in the design. Whichever approach you go with, make sure to stick with it because if you crisscross paths and do both at the same time, it can get pretty confusing very, very quickly. There's definitely some other stuff that I want to deep dive into. So if you're interested in that, please let me know and I could probably go into some sort of in-depth video. But for now, let's try to refactor a component and see what we get. For the second part of this video, I'm going to refactor a dirty, dirty, dirty SAS component using all the tips from before while I eat this pepper that was requested by Mr. T. And this is no ordinary pepper. This is an Armageddon pepper, which is 1.8 million Scoville, a competitor for the Carolina Reaper that I actually grew in my backyard. So I'm going to eat it and then I'm going to refactor this component and we're going to see how this goes. So. Don't watch me. Don't watch me when I do this. This is like sadism if you watch me. Oh, okay. Not pretty. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Mm hmm. The trick is, don't swallow. Cause then your stomach is gonna be like fire. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. No water, no water. Let's do this. So the first thing I'll do is do my sorting. So width and height, I don't see anything on this card. No water, but my margin should go, go below. A to Z, border radius, margin and padding usually fall together based on scientific principle of my retardation. Okay. And, all right, Whew. I see, I have a card and a card button. 
and my button has a height on it which actually I might need water for this uh -huh. right border back close the border every time I talk it's like death in my mouth I'm really you will I'm gonna say who mm. oh that was so much better but every time I talk it's like fire in my throat okay so you want the letters of the button to naturally oh god I'm gonna hurt my mouth a little bit. Okay. Height and width. The text will apply the height, so you don't need that. The width will be based on the text and the padding. But we also want to add padding to make it look nice and pretty. And well, card button kind of sucks because it's two classes. So why not we make it? Our button, which is one class, excuse me. Oh, that feels like heaven in my mouth. And we want to keep our interaction states extremely close to the button. So we'll say hover and we'll tie focus in. I we'll want to change the background to red, which is a terrible color to transition to, which is the color of the pepper that makes you want to die. It's like a scorpion just stung my throat a billion times. And so that's A to Z. I don't see any. If you wanted to be more specific, excuse me, you would do background color. Background color. Perfect. And card title. This dire direct descendant selector is crazy combinator. Mr. T, you're an evil person. And... Line height is very mean. You can usually take the value that you want and divide it by the font size, which is 20. Mr. T, you're so evil. It's not going away. It's still as painful as it used to be. Excuse me. And card title P, what are you talking about? It's not, you're establishing a relationship with the title and the caption. I should not have done this. This is a terrible idea. And don't do this at home, kids. And wow, this media query is all the way down here. And the padding is changing to 16. The padding is already 16. So maybe the author intended it for it to be larger on larger screens. What the Water feels so good, and it's immediately back to torture. And so, my button is actually, if I look at my... Oh, that's terrible! Come on, me! I want a monkey! Yes! And while these are very logically ordered, they're not ordered within my SAS file. Ways to make a man cry. Make him eat a Armageddon pepper and do a CSS video. Okay. Now imagine this fire in my stomach right now. That's why you kids out there who are dumb enough to do this, you spit the pepper back out because, you know, this could kill a chicken. So now looking at it, I have a single class structure. I have all my... Oh, all my rules ordered properly and I have I have all my interaction states right next to the selector that it's affecting and, and that's great that's really good I love it but this all get rid of it and guess what guess what this card caption it's already um, it's already a P it's already display block. Excuse me. And guess what? Headers and 
have margin on them, so you have to erase them. And you'd want to put that for the title, too. Oh, now my mind is, like, numb. And I hope, I hope you can apply this to your project. And this is great. This is really good. Okay, I think we have everything that we need. We just need to make sure it's consistent within my file. It's actually getting a lot better now. I think I can actually start to... Uh, what was this? Caption. And then card button. Now the reason you do this is you want everything to be isolated because if you had, let's say, a news list, you wouldn't want some style confliction because you have a title within your news list and that selector is called title. Within this card, it's called title. Isolate it. Do yourself a favor. Screw the cascade. It should be cat style sheets, not cascading style sheets. And do that. And it'll be great. I want a monkey. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, everything is nice and neat. If I look at my file, actually, there aren't any elements that are position absolute within this card, so I don't need position relative. And I'm not even using this box shadow, but if I were to add in an interaction state, I couldn't tie focus because the card is just a div element that doesn't receive focus. And that's no good. And my card title, my card caption, looking great. I did the line height, the flexible line height, not a fixed pixel value. And I got my font size, great. But if you think about it, the default font size is 16, so remove that. You got your card caption. Uh, the line height's actually reasonable for the default browser style. Probably a little bit shrinky, but do what it do. And everything looks great. Now you see the other thing is I said background here, but then I said background color for the hover state. So background color, just to make it consistent. Background is a shorthand. You can add a whole bunch of stuff, but I think that's a great video. This really mellows me out, this pepper. It makes me very humble, down to earth. And I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, this is what the pepper looks like. I think this is very good scientific research. Um, I might actually take the seeds and plant them. Um, I, did I say I hope you enjoyed this video? I hope you do. Um, good, e good evening, sir. Good day, ma'am. Good, good, I hope. Um, K-pop, Tetris. Um, things. CSS is very good. Talk below. Okay, goodbye. See ya! When you walk away, you don't hear me say, please! Oh, baby! Don't go. Simple and clean is the way that you're making me feel tonight. It's hard to let go.